Uh, welcome once again to today's uh, presentation. And uh, we praise our Heavenly Father for being able to give us a, a good weather so that uh, we may share together in His Word. And so I want to welcome you to part two of uh, the, the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model. And uh, today we are looking at uh, an Adventist home, a key to a healthy church. And so I I'd like to pray then uh, we can be able to explore some quotations on this one before we come back on Friday to part uh, three of the Hebrew uh, Jewish wedding, the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model. And so whatever you are, I'll uh, invite you to kneel down, to bow down as uh, the Lord uh, enables you so that uh, we can be able to pray together. Lord in heaven, we are in your presence. You have given us good health, a good weather that uh, we may be able to Praise your name through the reading of um, inspiration. And uh, I pray that uh, today what we may learn may help us to be even uh, Christians at home, better Christians at home that we may represent thee in thy fullness in thy own church. And so bless your people. Those will be watching online. Those will be joining in. And uh, whatever you will need us to learn, Lord, help us to learn because uh, this is an important issue in our lives. Satan is really uh, perverting our marriages that uh, the church may become weak. And so strengthen us in this discourse. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, and so uh, I'd just like to share um, what the Lord has been putting in my mind and uh, what I have been putting together to the key to a healthy church that is uh, an Adventist home. We know that um, after all the institutions fail in this world, the only thing that will be remaining is home churches or uh, family altars as we may call them. And you can find several of them in the episodes of uh, Paul that when persecution was on a high and rising and souring so much, the only thing that remained is the house churches or the family altars. And uh, you find that Paul is encouraging this. Uh, I want us to run through these verses and then we see what uh, the Lord would want us to learn from um, these uh, issues. And so allow me to go to my Bible and then just uh, go to my to these uh, writings and so uh, I like to see this I'd like us to read some few verses the first one comes from the book of uh, Romans chapter 16 verses 5 I'm looking at uh, uh, Adventist home, a key to a healthy church. Um, and so look at uh, the book of uh, Romans. And uh, this is Romans chapter 16, verses uh, 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epenetus, who is the first fruit of Achaia unto Christ. And so you find that um, some people say that house churches are of the devil and so on, and uh, we shouldn't be having them. But you find that in the days of Paul, uh, we had house churches, although inspiration says that the churches should be built as monuments of the work that the Lord has done through the people, but also family altars are so much important, more so when uh, the Sunday laws and the uh, um, laws forbidding worship or regulating worship shall go into place. All what we shall be having are these uh, home churches. But also they are the key to a healthy church and we shall be seeing that in a, a little while. Another verse is um, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. 
The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in the house. So you find another issue. There's a church in the house. And then Colossians chapter 4, verses 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea or Laodicea and Nymphas and the church which is in his house. Another way. Another verse. Uh, and the last one, I think. Uh, Philemon chapter 1 or verse 2. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Now, uh, it is when these family altars are right that um, even the church at the church level, the church will be healthy. And um, I, I want us to go through some quotes and see how the spirituality of a home really affects the church at large. In fact, when appointing the elders, this is uh, what um, uh, we read in the book of uh, First Timothy, is it chapter three? First Timothy, first, um, Timothy chapter three. We find that this is a true saying. If a man desires the office of bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine or striker, nor greedy or filth looker, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So how will we have leaders in church who don't know what is family life? It is impossible for you to be a leader of the family of God, the whole church, when you are not a person who understands what is family life and you cannot take care of your family. And so these marriages that we are having the church was built on the healthy family. And so the church depends on the family being spiritually mature. Because if we can't order our families well, then what we will do, we will bring out what is in our family into the church of God and dealing with delicate minds uh, uh, in the church when we have not been able to know how to deal with our own families, which are close uh, to us and which are of our blood, then there's no way we are going to deal with others who are ourselves. And so we must make sure that when we are entering into marriage, we are entering on it knowing that it is a spiritual institution. It is a place where spirituality is matured and the, that spirituality is taken to the church. And also we are told that... Um, um, verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And so you found out the issue of being able to rule your house well, uh, uh, being one of the qualifications of uh, being able to be given the church position. A man will not never be an elder, a deacon, a pastor, an evangelist, a prophet, a prophetess. Call anything that you can call. He can or she cannot be a good leader of the church if she cannot be um, a good uh, ruler of her own of or his own uh, uh, family. And so it is key that uh, we take care of our marriages if we will expect to find any healthy church upon the face of uh, uh, the earth. And so uh, uh, allow me to uh, go into this. Allow me to go into some of these quotations uh, about home religion, how actually, and how marriage 
that is healthy provides a, a healthy uh, is a key to a, a healthy church. And so um, I want you us to look at these things. Uh, we are told that um, now I want to tell you what a saint is. A saint in heaven is just what he is in his own family at home. If he is a Christian at home, he is a Christian in the church. You see, it doesn't start with the church and then the home, but it starts with the family and then it goes to the church. He will be a good Christian in heaven. Now God has placed us on a trial here. How is it with you? Are you going to stand the test? He will bring circumstances around you to prove you and see whether there is any defilement of character in you. If there is any debasement, if there is any carnality, if there is any satanic tendency, he will bring you over the ground in one way and then he will bring you over the ground he will bring you over the ground in another way and then he will test you upon one point and then he will test you upon another. We are here to be tested and proved. And where are we being tested? We are being tested in our marriages and in our families. If we can be able to ordain our families well, then God can entrust us with being in charge of his flock or his greater flock, which is the church. Those who are just joining in, we are talking about an Adventist home a key to a healthy church, how our marriages really affect the church. And so we are talking about when you are entering in courtship, engagement, and in marriage, don't think that marriage is only about you and your wife, but what you will be in marriage will affect what you will be in church. And we don't want to be people in marriages which are causing the church a, hard, a, church a hard time that um, we find that our marriages are so uh, contaminated that we carry the same influences into the church and then we infect others, the same atmosphere, and then the church of God becomes a dissected place, a place where actually the angels of God cannot be. And this is coming from uh, Letters and Manuscript, Volume 7. That is Manuscript 35, 1891, Paragraph 45. Again, we are told, begin right in your own homes. Begin there to be truly courteous as Christ was. Be kind, live not to please yourselves. Then if you are Christians at home, you will carry the same spirit into the church. How important it is to have a well-ordained marriage. You will carry it into your councils and will have evidence that Jesus is indeed your helper, your stronghold, your front guard, and your rear world. The righteousness of Christ will go before you and the glory of God will be your reward. This is actually speaking of Isaiah chapter 58. And you understand well that Isaiah chapter 58 is the third angel's message to Seventh-day Adventists. In that, the, 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 the third angel's message to the world is the mark of the beast. The third angel's message to the Adventist church is Isaiah 58 that is medical missionary and family life. And in that family life, you have the feeding of the poor, the clothing of the naked, the visiting of those who are in prison, and the lifting the bones of those who are in affliction. Once we set our families right, we can carry that atmosphere to the church and have a church which is harmonious. It doesn't have uh, warmongers, it doesn't have naysayers, it doesn't have idle people. It is, doesn't have evil surmises because we have learned in our family to be Christian, the same atmosphere will be carried into the church. Don't think that uh, you can miss to be a Christian in your family and then be, go in church and be a Christian. This is what we are told it is impossible. Continued on, we are told, now let the parents go to work for their children. Don't let them hear a fretful word spoken in the house. Tell them angels are there watching over them and they must enter into no sinful practice. Tell them the heavenly intelligences are looking upon them and don't allow a word to be spoken from your lips to educate your children in words to dishonor God. Ah, there are scores here that need to be converted on this line. 
And unless they are converted, they never will know what the love and joy of Christ is in the heart and can never be translated to live with the heavenly family. So religion is uh, narrowed down to how you are living in your own house before God looks at you, how you live in the church. I tell you, once we are making up our minds to enter into marriage, we should understand that we are entering into the highest institution on the face of the earth because the family is an institution that is a symbol of the church. You want that faith that works out your salvation after the divine similitude. Why? You tell us that by our works we are not saved. Nevertheless, you are not saved by any evil works, but you have that faith that works out a character after the divine similitude. It is a faith that works out a unity of action, brother with a brother, and every hour of your life, you, if you are standing in living connection with God, you manifest his love. It works in your home life. There is no fulfillment seen in the home if Christ, there is no, full, there is no fretfulness seen in the home if Christ is the peace principle exercise in your soul. There is no uncourteousness there. There is no roughness or sharp speech there. Why? Because we believe and act out that we are members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king, bound to Jesus Christ by the strongest tie of love, that love which works by faith and purifies the soul. Continued on, we are told that uh, you love Jesus and you are constantly at work to overcome all selfishness and be a blessing and comfort and strength and a support to the souls he has purchased with his blood. I cannot see why we should not the more honestly try to bring the peace of Christ right into our family than to labor for those that have no living connection with us. But if we have religion in the home, it will extend outside of the home. So once we have been able to bring our family members to the religion of Christ, then we can think of doing the field missionary work. But uh, the mission that we have been given is to make sure that our families are brought to God. Then we can think of other people who are outside the family. Continued on, you will have it everywhere. That is the true religion. You will carry it with you to the church. So what has been brought in the home, we are being told that you will carry it to the church. You can carry it with you when you go out to your work. And what else? It will be with you wherever you shall be. What we want is religion in the home. What we need is the peace principle which shall control our spirit and our life and character after the Christ, after the Christ life. He has given us his example. God help us that we may walk and work intelligently to this end. There is no virtue in your prayers to God when you get right up from your prayer and begin to speak sharp words and make yourself disagreeable in your family. When you get up from your prayers and begin to fret and to find fault with everything, everything and with God himself, for this has been done, your prayers don't go any higher than your head. Shall we now have that faith that works by love and purifies the soul here where this reformation means so much? Well, that is what we want because the latter rain is coming. We want the vessel all cleansed from it is work of impurity. We want the vessel to be a vessel unto honor, fit for the master's use. There are vessels to dishonor and there are vessels to honor. Now we want to make our choice and reveal that we choose to be a vessel unto honor. Then. There is no quarreling man, there is not a quarreling man, no matter if your profession is as high as heaven, nor a quarreling woman, not one that loves to talk and berate and wound and injure the soul and reputation of God's people that will ever enter the portals of the city of God. Why? Because there will be a second rebellion in heaven. What we need now is to be students, to learn in the school of Christ, to perfect a Christ-like character. Now, if we have this uh, sinful character in the home, if we have this demeanoring spirit at home, 
then the same is extended in the church. And you see how actually the inspiration says that uh, whenever we are having these things, then we shall not enter into heaven because there will be a second rebellion, which means the reason why we are seeing a lot of rebellion in church, people fighting, people debating, it is because of the spirit that we are having at home. And then we carry it into the church. That spirit will never be taken into heaven because there shall be a second rebellion. And so what we are seeing and witnessing happening in the church, let us go back to the board. It is not about our doctrinal differences. It is not about our understanding of the scriptures. It is not about our leadership and our roles in the church. It is about how we are dealing with each other at family levels. The same spirit is what is being extended in the church. And uh, once you see people fighting in the church, debating and quarreling, it is the same thing they are doing in their houses. And if they will be converted in their own houses, then we will not have the same things happening in the, in the churches. Because there's nothing you fear. If you have been at home, you don't fear your husband, you don't fear your wife, you don't fear your children. Who else will you fear? You cannot fear anyone. You can go at any place and do anything because you don't care because that is what your family is used to and you think everyone can get used to that. And um, that is why we are being told that an Adventist home is the key to a healthy church. Religion is a personal matter. We are not saved by companies. We are not saved by having our names in the church books. You, you notice that? We are not saved by numbers. The matter is how is it with my soul? Have I made a surrender to God? Luke chapter 10. Read the testament to Christ. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Christ responds to the lawyer. What is written in the law? How readest thou? Read the whole of this point in Luke chapter 10. Am I converted to God? Has his transforming power made me a new man? Am I kind? Have I the attributes of Christ or the attributes of Satan? Am I polite to God whose property in souls I am responsible for? Am I kind? Am I patient? Am I tender? Do I have the love of Christ for the souls for whom he has died? And this is talking about the family that God has given unto you. The book of Jeremiah chapter 13 verses 20, we find something so amazing. We read this, but uh, we can just repeat. Repetition makes an impression. Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 20. We are told, lift up your eyes and behold them that uh, come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee, thy beautiful flock? And so God is asking us, where are our families? We who are saying that we are doing a great work, going on missions and uh, trying to find people who are in uh, most horrendous situations and bring them to Christ, we are being asked, where is the little flock that I gave unto you? And many of the families will be ashamed when such a question is laid upon them. Where is your wife? Where is your husband? Where are your little children that I gave unto you? Because we do not educate ourselves to have home religion and then bring the same atmosphere in the church, we lost our family and we were a stumbling block to the people who came to the church. This is from, uh, we are still continuing to read from uh, Letters and Manuscript, Volume 7, Manuscript 35, the year is 1891. Now, the greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can, for it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. This is Faith I Live By, page 254, paragraph 8. I'll repeat this because this resonates with what we are saying again. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world. If you want to present any evidence that you are a Christian to the outside world, then show your well-ordered family. Then somebody will be, say, be able to say, there is a Christian man, there is a Christian wife, there is a Christian child a well-ordered family. Um, and that is why we are insisting that um, those who have not entered into marriage, we have to be so careful how we enter into the marriage. It's not about choosing a partner, but it's about God bringing you a partner as he brought Eve to Adam. 
you know, so, some people think that it is our duty to choose partners and to start pursuing people and uh, searching here and here for a husband or a wife. That is not our duty. A good wife, a good husband cometh from the Lord. It doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say that a good wife or a good husband is searched for in some region, some place in this world. No. Somebody goes on their knees and the Lord and another person is praying somewhere. You see what was happening with Isaac. Isaac is praying. Rebecca is somewhere, somewhere praying. And Eliezer is on the way going to uh, 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 execute his uh, noble duty of bringing. In fact, Abraham charges him to bring. And you, doesn't, you don't bring something that has not been given unto you. You bring something that has been given unto you. And whom were they depending to give a wife? When Eliezer is setting forth to go to uh, 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 bring this wife, he, he tells the Lord, this is the sign that I'll know you have given me a wife for your man servant. And so he doesn't lay down categories about this and this, but um, he gives simple things that um, he expects God to work on. And uh, so uh, the, the, the bottom line issue is that uh, the evidence of uh, the power of Christianity is shown with a well-ordained family. And so when uh, we are entering into marriage relations, let us think about this, that my family, my marriage, is going to show the world if I'm a Christian or if I'm not a Christian. Once we put that ahead of the list, then everything becomes secondary. It will mean that um, uh, uh, Christian character will be number first on your list more than how beautiful is she, what is the color of her skin, how handsome is he, or what tribe does he come from. This will be not be appearing on your list. There will be so much secondary that um, the Christian character will outshine anything else that uh, you can ever put on your list of uh, a husband or a wife. And so continued on. Uh, in, uh, that is, uh, This is coming from uh, Testimonies to the Church, volume 3, page 294. Thus we read, the order and prosperity of the kingdom depended upon the good order of the church. I want us to look at this. And the prosperity, harmony, and order of the church depended upon the good order and thorough discipline of families. Praise the Lord. There is no healthy church without a healthy marriage. If we are going to solve the very issues we are facing in church, everyone will have to go back at their home and make things right, then come back to the church. Once we solve these issues at home, then we come to the church, you will have a healthy deaconess, a healthy deacon, you will have a healthy elder, you will have a healthy pastor. Because these people have come to have a relationship with Christ at home, then they can have a telling influence when they come together as a, a, a church. And so what we need right now is not to come in the church and sit and debate about doctrines. And more so um, how we view things and how we tolerate people and how we long suffer people. We have to go back and check if our families are right. Once we settle that, then we can come into the church of God and see if we can do a serious evangelism. God punishes unfaithfulness of parents to whom he has entrusted the duty of maintaining the principles um, of parental government, which lie at the foundation of church discipline and the prosperity of the nation. Again, your family do not only affect the church, but your family affects the prosperity of your nation. One undisciplined child has frequently marred the peace of harmony of a church and incited a nation to murmuring and rebellion. 
in a most solemn manner, the Lord has enjoined upon children their duty to affectionately respect and honor their parents. And on the other hand, he requires parents to train up their children and with unceasing diligence to educate them with regard to the claims of his law, to instruct them in the knowledge of and fear of God. These injunctions, which God laid upon the Jewish with so much solemnity, rest with equal weight upon Christian parents. Now you, you start getting the gist of the matter in the ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model, that they had to make sure that this family was coming here uh, or coming on the scene and getting into union and for what purpose? To exalting the religion of God. In fact, this is what we are told in the book of Malachi. We shall go to the book of Malachi chapter two once again. The book of Malachi chapter. Why does God give us marriages? Why does God give us a marriage? And look at uh, Malachi chapter two and verse 15. And did not he make one? Malachi 2.15, yet had he the residue of the spirit. And wherefore, what is the reason of God making a man and a woman become one? That he might seek a godly seed. Now, what is this issue about a godly seed? You go back to Genesis 3, verse 15. Genesis 3, verse 15. And I'll put an enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy to be ever given to the two pairs, that is Adam and Eve, and to the church. That God, after their sin, God was going to put his spirit again in them, that they may raise a holy seed. And that seed may be able to bruise the head of the serpent. While the serpent sought to bruise their heel, God was going to raise a seed which shall bruise the head of the serpent. And what does it mean to bruise the head of the serpent? That is Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. And look at this verse. That is verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hand upon the head of the live God, that is the escape God, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the God and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man in the wilderness. So for us to crush the head of the serpent, we must overcome sin. We must give all our sins to the high priest. And this has to narrow down to the family level. How are we raising our families? Are we raising them as holy seeds or are we raising them as the seed of the serpent? And so this is the reason why God decided to bring man and woman together. Wherefore, why did he make them one? that he might seek a holy seed. So ask yourself, in your family, in your marriage, is your purpose the purpose of God to raise up a holy or a godly seed to bruise the head of the serpent, to crush Satan, so that you may raise up a family which is an Adventist home, an example of a Christian family which can inspire other people to live in holiness of life. If this is not the purpose why we are marrying, then we have a wrong purpose of marrying. Continued on, uh, we find that um, this duty is the duty that was given to the Jews. And so when the ancient Hebrew were coming together in marriage, the marriage alliances were to raise up a, 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 an Israel for God, a church for God, a holy seed. And so, these injunctions which God laid upon the Jewish with so much solemn interest with equal weight upon Christian parents. So the, the way they, they conducted their weddings, their marriages, is the way that we should copy. And the same responsibilities they had when entering into this are the same responsibility we have. 
But those who neglect the light and instruction which God has given in his word in regard to training their children and commanding their household after them will have a fearful account to settle. Aaron's criminal neglect to command the respect and reverence of his son resulted in their death. And this did not only affect the family of Aaron, but it affected the sanctuary services. Because it brought the people to think that they can just come the way they want into the sanctuary. In fact, God had to tell Aaron not just to be coming in the sanctuary the way he wants after the family, after his sons were slain. And so anything at the family level which will cheapen the religion of Christ, it is a strange fire in the sanctuary of the Lord. And those who do not take care of how they uh, conduct their families will meet the same fate that the sons of Aaron met. And um, this is coming from 3 t 294. Again, the most favorable argument. What is the most favorable argument? Um, we are told in uh, uh, Letters and Manuscript, uh, Volume 6, Letter 6b, the year is 1890. Let us read what it says. Uh, the most, most favorable argument to the truth. Uh, that family properly conducted is a favorable argument to the truth. And the head of such a family will carry out the very same kind of work in the church as is revealed in the family. So again and again, whatever you do in the family, God says it's what you will practice in the, in, the, in the church. Whatever severity, harshness, and want of affection and love are exhibited in the sacred circle of the home, there will most assuredly be a failure in the plans and management in the church. Oh, now, these truths are hitting us so hard personally, and I hope you are even also being hit with them so hard that now you, you, you are starting to review. How will I get into the marriage? How can I go back and reconcile with my husband or my wife? How can I make sure that I represent Christ right? And if you are thinking in those lines, then uh, I can assure, assure tell you that uh, God is speaking to you. So the family... Properly conducted is a favorable argument to the truth. And the head of such a family will carry out the very same kind of work in the church as revealed in the family. Now, wherever severity, harshness, and want of affection and love are exhibited in the sacred sack of the home, there will be most assuredly be a failure in the plans and management in the church. Unity in the home, unity in the church reveals Christ's manner and grace more than sermons and arguments. The servants of God must not strive, but in meekness instruct those who oppose themselves against the truth that they may see the errors of their ways and be converted. But let your light shine in good works, in careful, patient, brotherly words, speak to those with whom you associate in good works. Again, home religion will exert an influence in the neighborhood and in the church. Let us in Manuscript Volume 7, letter 18b, 1891, paragraph 20. He who is engaged in the work of the gospel ministry must be faithful in his family life. It is as essential that as a father, he should improve the talents God has given him for the purpose of making the home a symbol of the heavenly family as that in the work of the ministry, he should make use of his God-given powers to win souls for the church as the priest in the home and as the ambassador of Christ in the church, he should exemplify in his life the character of Christ. He must be faithful in watching for souls as one that must give an account. In his service, there must be seen no carelessness and inattentive work. God will not serve with the sins of men who have not a clear sense of the sacred responsibility involved in accepting a position as pastor of a church. He who fails to be a faithful designing shepherd in the home will surely fail of being a faithful shepherd to the flock of God in the church. Again, again and again and again, show me the relationship you sustain with your spouse and I'll show you a Christian. The first work 
of Christians is to be united in the family. Then the work is to extend to their neighbors, nigh and afar off. Adventist Home, page 37, paragraph 4. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, these are serious things to contemplate upon as we think about entering into marriage. Now, what if we have entered into marriage and we didn't know about these things? I repeat again, in the days of ignorance, God winged at it, we can share this as we close. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts 17, 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winged at it, or winged at but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Repenting is turning away from the ideas and the plans we have had, which are not according to the word of God, and now pursuing what the word of God says. And so I pray that uh, with this short discourse, we shall review our lives once again. We shall review our relationships once again and the partners we are entering marriage with. We shall go back, those who we are married, to our families and have a reconciliation. In fact, I cannot end without reading Peter's counsel to the parents, page 29, and see just a parting shot what we who are married have to do if we have not gotten this thing right. Peter's counsel to the parents, page 29. Negligent to the children to be confessed. If we have not raised up our families the way that we should raise them, it is a time that we confessed. Brethren and sisters, I beg of every one of you to make the most of this committing of these teachings. If you have backslidden, I entreat you for Christ's sake to return to him. Be done what? Reconverted. Let the conversations begin today. Let parents confess to their children in regard to the points in which they have neglected their duty. Let them confess their negligence in regard to allowing their children to follow the passions and to mingle in worldly society simply because they wanted to be like the world. It is impossible for us to be Christ-like while, while we are world-minded. We cannot separate ourselves from the world itself. We must remain in the world, but we must, we should separate from it is evil practices, it is wrong ideas, it is sinfulness. We should practice self-denial in everything in order to have power by living faith in Christ to claim the richest promises given us in his word. And so those who haven't entered into marriage, you don't want to make a false, a, a, a wrong move and let a regret and start actually confessing things that you should have corrected before you enter into the marriage. Those who are already there, God is telling us, it is a time to make things right. It's not too late to confess to your children, to confess to your husband, to confess to your wife. This is the ideas I have had about marriage, but they have been wrong. And now I want us to study again and by the strength of Christ to follow his word rather than opinions and ideas that we have gotten from marriages which are not ordained of God and from books which purport to be teaching about how to have a good marriage and a good family, yet they are off key of what the scriptures say. And so information is not condemnation. And uh, I pray that the Lord may work out in us his salvation with fear and trembling because he is the one who wills to do of his own good pleasure in our lives. That is Philippians chapter two uh, from verse 12 onward. And uh, yeah, these things teach them. And these things, the best way to teach them is to practice them. May the Lord bless us this evening and uh, shall we close up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we have backslidden in many ways. But then there's no sinner who has gone so far as not to be touched with the blood of thy son. And we cannot atone for our past, but we can look at the bright future before us because Christ has won and had a victory over Satan on Calvary. And we can enjoy the benefits of his victory and atonement that is making us one with him. And so we rejoice because this information has not come to us too late, but just timely so that we may re-examine ourselves more than we examine others. 
give us the strength to make the right steps from now on. In Jesus' name, we ask of these things. Amen. God bless us, and uh, we shall be continuing with this uh, ancient Hebrew Jewish wedding model, part three, when we shall come to look at uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 25. And so those who are joining online, until next time, God be with you.